Well, hello, everyone. This is Dr. Rick Cromie, and I'm here for another installment in the incredible journey, the majestic journey, the epic journey of Lewis and Clark. In this session, what I want to do is unpack the Montana experience, really from the Mandan villages of uh, North Dakota all the way through Montana in the summer of 1805 to uh, the Idaho line. It's a bit of a special session for me. As a native Montanan, I grew up with these stories. And I didn't realize until the past year when I started to dive into the journals how much I didn't know about the Montana chapter. And it's why it takes a little bit of time to unpack it for you. There's so much happening in this particular part of the story. And I just want to lay it out for you. I want to start by looking at this map, which shows uh, really where they started in the spring of 1805. They wintered in Fort Mandan. Uh, this is where they're going to pick up Sacagawea and Toussaint Charbonneau, her husband. And uh, of course, uh, Sacagawea has on her back a little infant baby, a, a baby boy that's only two months old, really just weeks old when they start off on this particular journey. And they're going to travel, uh, continue to travel up the Missouri River all the way into Montana. And they're going to have some issues along the way. We're going to talk about these when we get into it, but they're going to have a stopping point, uh, really a big stopping point at um, Great Falls, Montana. And they're going to have to portage around the river at that point. And then they're going to get back on the Missouri and they're going to continue to go upstream. And, and they're going to come to a place called Three Forks, where there's literally three different rivers that feed into the Missouri River. It's the Missouri River headwaters. But they didn't know that. Uh, they, they just saw three rivers and they had to assume, at least they did, uh, assumed that you know, the Missouri River was still one of those forks. So they traveled down uh, into southwest Montana, where they're going to meet uh, up with the uh, Shoshone. They're going to connect there with the Shoshone Indians. Uh, this is going to be a great reunion for Sacagawea to get back and in connection with her native tribe, her, her home tribe, if you will. And from there, they're going to travel up uh, uh, to Idaho, they're going to cross over the Bitterroot Range and drop down into the Clearwater River area. And it's in that, that area where they're going to meet the Nez Pierce. And we'll talk about that in this entire session. Now, one thing that's important to understand is that there was a there was a lot of anxiety as far as this part of the trip. I mean, there who wouldn't who wouldn't say there was anxiety? They really didn't know where they were going. They were going off the map at this point. It's interesting what Meriwether Lewis writes in his journal on April 7th of 1805. He says, quote, we were now about to penetrate a country at least 2,000 miles in width on which the foot of civilized man had never trod. The good or evil it had in store for us was for experiment yet to be determined. I couldn't but esteem this moment of my departure as among the most happy of my life. And there you get a bit of the disposition of Meriwether Lewis. He's the feeler. Uh, you don't see Clark writing like this. Clark is more military. He just gives the report. He tells us what happens on each and every day. Lewis, Lewis is more of a feeler. He he get, brings his emotions into this uh, into the story, and it's why it's such a great epic story. So As the long winter slowly ended. They asked their Indian friends what lay ahead. The chiefs drew lines on the dirt floors of their lodges, while Clark transferred the information onto a map he was preparing for Jefferson. There was a tremendous waterfall farther upriver, one chief told them, and then they would have to pass through a range of shining mountains. The captains calculated that the portage around the falls would take only half a day. And the mountains, they were sure, were like the ones they knew in Virginia, two or three days at most to cross. They told the chiefs they could make it to the Pacific and back to the Mandan villages before winter came again. By early April, the ice was out of the river. Lewis and Clark sent a dozen men back to St. Louis with the big keelboat. 
loaded with materials for Jefferson, lengthy reports about Indian tribes, box after box of specimens, and five live animals, including the prairie dog they had flooded from its home. With the shipment went a letter from Lewis, speaking for all of those who were about to leave Fort Mandan for the unknown. The Corps of Discovery was no longer the undisciplined collection of frontiersmen who had left St. Louis a year earlier. At this moment, every individual of the party are in good health and excellent spirits, zealously attached to the enterprise and anxious to proceed. Not a whisper of discontent or murmur is to be heard among them, but all in unison act with the most perfect harmony. With such men, I have but little to fear and everything to hope. They're gonna leave Fort Mandan as a cohesive team. They've spent a long year going up the river together and they spent a really hard winter together in North Dakota. So now they're gonna work as a team and they're gonna need it because they're leaving where the map is and they're about to go into the real unknown. Yes, that's right. They're literally going into the unknown. It's unknown country. They, they're, they're off the map. And they're not going to get back on the map until they really get on the Columbia River uh, later in the year. And it's going to be much later. Uh, it's, it's amazing they got as far as they did in this particular season. But in the winter of 1804-1805, basically, Lewis and Clark whittled down the core because uh, they were going to send some men back to St. Louis. And they were going back on the barge. There was no reason, no, no way, really, they could take the barge much further. It was just too shallow for that big of a ship. And so they all got into the, the white pirogue and the red pirogue, and they had six canoes. And, and from there, they basically hauled those canoes with all of their provisions upriver. And uh, again, they left on April 7th of 1805. Thirteen men, again, went back to St. Louis. They had letters. They had reports. They had animals plants on that particular uh, uh, barge. Three new persons were added, Toussaint Charbonneau, Chicago Wea, and of course, Pomp. Uh, it's real, his name is actually Jean Baptiste, the infant's name is, but uh, Pomp was a nickname that the Shoshone Indian gave to all of their firstborn children. And Pomp was kind of a, one of those, it was basically picked up by the captains and they often referred to him just simply as Pomp rather than Jean Baptiste, which was his, his given name. Again, there were 33 total that went upriver with them. Now, it doesn't take too long on this journey before they start having some, um, some issues. And one of the big issues very early on in the spring, the late spring of 1805, was the wind. Really, day after day after day, some days it literally stopped them. They could not go any further. They just had to pull because you can't take canoes up a up a river that's got rolling white capped uh, waves and and it, it just and they had too many precious things on board, including Chicago we and a baby. They couldn't risk that type of uh, you know even tipping a canoe would would have been a, a dangerous and potentially fatal. Uh, thing that would go on so you find that they're constantly battling the wind i mean the, it's just over and over again now occasionally they got a good wind if they got a wind from the south and the east coming in they put up their sails and they would travel much faster on those days but uh, a lot of times the wind blew from the north and from the west and in fact check out this journal entry from april 24th of 1805 lewis writes these words he says the wind blew so hard that we were unable to move its violence caused the waves to rise in such a manner as to wet many articles in the small canoes. Sore eyes is a common complaint among the party. And that's because there was too much sand literally blowing around. It was blowing into their eyes. It was blowing into their mouths. It was blowing up their nose. It was blowing in their ears. It was just, but sore eyes were a common complaint. And he, he again, talks about it originates from these the sandbars uh, that were basically on, along the river there in the Missouri bottoms. On April 25th, they finally make it to the mouth of the Yellowstone. They're now officially in Montana at this point. 
the uh, Yellowstone River is going to be significant in this story because, uh, well, Lewis actually goes, kind of reconnoiters it. He travels up it a little bit just to check it out and see what, what they're looking at. But uh, they have pretty good information from the, uh, the Indians at that point that, you know, this Yellowstone is kind of really the roadmap, uh, the roadway, the waterway to the southwest part of Montana. Uh, they had some pretty good indications that the Missouri River was even a, a, a much longer route, uh, not just had the Great Falls uh, that they were going to come upon. They had to porridge around the Great Falls. They knew about that. The, there were Indians reports as far as all those things. But the mouth of, about the Yellowstone was significant because it was considered a shortcut down to the to uh, southwest Montana where the Shoshone lived. And they had to find the Shoshone. The Shoshone Indians, they had to find them because the Shoshone had horses. And they knew they could not get over the mountains with canoes. You can't, can't do that. You've got to have horses to pack all the stuff that they were going to need. So that's why Sacagawea is along. That was such a godsend for them. That was such a blessing for them to have Sacagawea uh, and, and Toussaint Charbonneau along the way. But they reached the mouth of the Yellowstone on April 25th. And then they continue moving uh, to the west upriver. And it's just a few days later where they run into their, their second obstacle. I talked about wind. Well, their second obstacle is one that's going to annoy them for a much longer time. And I'm not just talking about the mosquitoes yet. The mosquitoes are going to be a bear cat for them. But uh, the real bear cat for them is the grizzly bears. And on April 29th of 1805, they ran in uh, to some grizzly bears. And here's what Lewis wrote in his journal on that day. He says, about 8 a.m. we fell in with two grizzly bears, which is not a good thing, by the way, both of which we wounded and one of them made his escape. And the other, after my firing on him, pursued me for 70 or 80 yards, but fortunately had been so badly wounded that he was unable to pursue so closely. We again repeated our fire and killed him. It was a male, not fully grown. We estimated his weight at 300 pounds. Now that's a small grizzly bear. And in fact, they're going to run into some very large grizzly bears before this is over. These grizzlies are chasing them up trees. They're chasing them across the plains. They're, 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 they're pursuing them even into the river. And it wasn't too long before they realized there were a couple things that they learned about grizzly bear behavior. One was that grizzly bears don't climb trees. That's good. So that if they could climb a tree fast enough, now realize if you got a bear chasing you, you better be darn fast in your climbing skills. And these men realized that, you know, they, they always kind of had, you know, kind of a backdoor plan, if you will. They, you know, they tried to stay close to the woods. They tried to stay close to trees whenever they were encountering and trying to bring down these things. The other thing they realized is that um, grizzly bears don't swim. Uh, they, they don't do well in water. And so if you could get into the river, you were you had a good chance of getting away from the grizzly bear. They'd only go so far in and the grizzlies tended to stay out of, of the river as well. And that was good. Uh, a third lesson they learned though, and you see it right here, uh, they wounded a lot of grizzlies. I, I got to tell you, the journals are very interesting to read through that summer because almost every day they're shooting down different types of animals and pretty much two, three times a week, at least from this point, all the way up to just past Great Falls, Montana, they're in grizzly bear territory. And the grizzlies are so thick that, um, and, and they when they wound them, and I, I think it's interesting that probably that summer they wounded, you know, maybe two, three dozen bears wounded them uh they, they didn't bring them down they shot one bear uh when they they finally got it killed and 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 they dressed it out they found that it, eight different musket balls had gone through that bear from different directions in fact what they realized and this is really the the, the big lesson about the grizzlies was if you want to bring down a grizzly you got to hit them in the right spot and the right spot was a front shot right in the right in the middle of the forehead that was the only place and some of these grizzlies also had very thick skulls so th these guys were running with with you know kentucky long rifles they thought these bears would be no problem i mean they're used to shooting black bears back east they had never you know even the indians when they warned them they said listen you need to realize these grizzly bears are the type that when you go into battle with them you know the indians actually dressed for war they painted their faces for war. To bring back a grizzly was considered an act of valor and courage to the Indian. 
But Lewis and Clark and the, the company at first were kind of casual about this whole idea. Oh, these bears can't be that bad. Well, let's just say the bears basically proved the point. They can be that bad. And there were a lot of near misses with these grizzlies. Uh, it's surprising uh, that only one person died on this particular journey and expedition because the grizzlies were all over them. They were thick on them, really, all the way up through the Missouri River to, to Great Falls, just past Great Falls. But it's interesting, on May 6, 1805, Lewis makes this, uh, um, let, let's say it's an addendum in the journal. Uh, it's basically a follow-up comment. He says, I find that the curiosity of our party is pretty well satisfied with respect to the grizzly. The formidable appearance of the male bear killed on the 5th added to the difficulty with which they die, even when shot through the vital parts. And it has staggered the resolution of several men. Others, however, seem keen for action with the bear. And I expect these gentlemen will give us some amusement. <laughs> so Lewis is basically saying, hey, listen, uh, these bears are going to give us some uh, some pleasure. They're going to amuse us. But uh, the reality is these bears were a very dangerous, dangerous enemy and encounter that they, they would have. Now, they did reach the mouth of the Milk River on May 8th of 1805. Again, they're heading west. There are certain landmarks I think are interesting. The Milk River is one of them. Why would they call it the Milk River? This is one of the river. You know, they named everything, and very few of the things they named actually stuck. But this is one that stuck. They call this the Milk River. Well, maybe this picture will show why. This is the Missouri River as it's going to the east. And as you can see from the north comes the Milk River. And if you were to track the Milk River, which starts over around uh, Glacier National Park, it's like a big spaghetti. It just goes every which direction. It goes back and it's just all over the place. But eventually it dumps out into the Missouri there in Northeast Montana. And as you can tell, it's like milk. It's it's a, a very milky look to it because of the sand and the the, the sediments that it, it churns up. A few days later, there is a day, and it involves a grizzly bear again. I don't have time to tell you that story. It's an amazing story uh, where uh, uh, several of the hunters basically try to take down a grizzly, and it just becomes a real uh, bad moment for them. But for Upstream, at the same time, there was another bad moment happening. And Chicago Wea basically saves the day. And what happens is Lewis and Clark are doing something they rarely did, and they were both on shore. Usually one of the captains would be on shore. The other one would be, be in the ship or in the boats there, you know, making sure, guiding them, making sure they were doing all right. But it was important to have one captain in the boats at all time. Chicago Wea and Toussaint Charbonneau, and they were running, um, I believe it was the White Perroque, uh, when um, there was um, – and Toussaint Charbonneau, who's not a river man, let's just let's just say it right now. Sakaga Wea's husband had very little skills for this journey. He couldn't hunt. He couldn't fish. He couldn't run a river. He, 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 had, he, he wasn't really much of a frontiersman. Uh, the only thing we know that he did well was cook. He could cook pretty well. In fact, he cooked up a buffalo. They called, they called it white pudding. It was it looked like a sausage from the intestines of a of a buffalo. Uh, he was really good at that. That was, that was a little French cooking on the way. But on this particular day, on, on May fourteenth, uh, they gave the reins of the of the canoe, the perroque, to Char, uh, Charbonneau. And uh, a gust of wind kind of got things going, and before you know it, the canoe is or the perroque is tipped over. The equipment, everything, baggage, everything in the Perot goes into the Missouri River. And this is where Chicago Wea uh, saves the day. And literally with a baby on, on her in her arms or on her back. But she <laughs> she saves the day. She starts bringing these uh, baggage back in. And, and it got wet. And some of this stuff was really delicate stuff. Instruments, for example. Journals were in, the, in this Perot. Uh, but on that day, Lewis was very complimentary about Chicago Wea. And, and he, he said, you know, Tucson Charbonneau, pff, we could do without him, basically. But Chicago Wea, uh, she's a big help to us. On May 26th of 1805, Lewis sees the Rocky Mountains for the first time. Now, you got they're heading west. 
And eventually they're, they're seeing little mountain ranges. They, they see, I know this area very well being a Montana and they, they, they could see the little Rockies there around Zortman and Landusky, Montana. Uh, they could see to the South, the Judith mountain range, uh, maybe even the moccasin mountain range as well. But as they're heading West, uh, Lewis looks off into the far away distance and he sees the Rocky mountains. And this is what he wrote. He says, from this point, I beheld the Rocky Mountains for the first time. But when I reflected on the difficulties, which the snowy barrier, because he saw snow on the tops of those Rocky Mountains, would most probably throw in my way to the Pacific Ocean and the sufferings and hardships of myself and party in them, it counterbalanced the joy I felt in the first moment I gazed upon them. In other words, woohoo, we found the, there's the Rockies. I can't wait. We've, we've actually seen the Rockies. And then he goes, uh-oh. These are not going to be easy to get over. These aren't like the little mountains back in the Appalachian range that they were used to. These were serious high peak mountains with snow. And his, his, his joy was counterbalanced with the reality that uh, there could be some tough times ahead. You know, Patrick Gass also talks about the terrain at this point. He says, quote, the views from the hills are interesting, grand, large rivers and streams in their rapid course, groves of cottonwood and willow along the waters intersecting the landscapes in different directions. It was literally the American Serengeti, because as he looked out, he could see these great plains, you know, enlivened, as he said, with the buffalo, elk, deer, and other animals, which in vast numbers feed upon the plains or pursue their prey. They are prominent objects. On May 29th of 1805, they find another river, a very beautiful river that flows into the Missouri River. And this is called, they, they named it the Judith River. And I actually, Captain Clark, I think, got in on this one. And it reminded him of his love interest back in Virginia, Julia Hancock, or Judith. Her name was Judith. What's interesting is Judith will eventually become his wife. And they will, they will marry, and they will have kids back there in St. Louis after the expedition. A couple of days later, they enter into the Missouri River Breaks. And this is where things start to get a little, um, little dicey for them because they start to, the, the climate literally changes. The, the environment literally changes for them. Uh, these, these breaks, and you're seeing a little bit of the white sandstone uh, that, that they saw as they went forward or went up river. Uh, but they're, this is some really rugged country. In fact, when I was a Boy Scout back in um, back as a as a child, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, I earned my 50 miler merit badge by canoeing the Missouri River breaks. I can tell you it was three days of hard work going downstream. Just going downstream was hard work because the river is fairly placid at this point. You you actually have to work. If you just let yourself float, you're not going to get anywhere. You're floating at one mile an hour. But uh, to go upstream, you know, you're going against the current a little bit, but it's still, it's the, it's the breaks. And they call it the Missouri River breaks for a reason, because it literally breaks up the area and changes in such a, a great way. It's interesting, William Clark, when he looked at this particular area, he, he made this quote. He said, this country may with propriety, I think, be termed the deserts of America, as I do not conceive any part that can ever be settled, as it is deficient in water, timber, and too steep to be tilled. Well, eventually they reach a place in early June that they're going to call Decision Point, where the river divide, and, and they had no idea which one was the true Missouri. And every one of the men, to a T, basically felt the North River was the river. And the reason was, was because it looked more like the Missouri. Uh, as uh, on the other side, the, the, the river going to the west and, and to the south uh, there uh, was more clear in water. And so they, they thought that was the tributary that was coming in from another stream. But they thought that the river to the north and to the west was, um, was the right one. Well, long story short, they reconnoitered the area. Clark took several men and he went up to the river that went to the, the, the left fork. You know, Lewis took several men and he went up the right fork. And um, they spent several days out there taking a look at it. And Lewis decided fairly early on that, you know, wow, um, I think this is not the Missouri, you know. In fact, he named it eventually the Maria's River, uh, named after one of his relatives, Maria's River. It's today known as the Marias. 
It's up there near Fort Benton, Montana. You know, the men again were to a T when they, they put it up for a vote. The men all said, Hey, thumbs up. That's the, that's the Missouri. That's a true Missouri. So on June 9th, Lewis and Clark, the captains decided against what the other men felt that the best way to go was to the, to the left, which again was, is going to prove to be the true Missouri. They were right. Uh, the rest of the men were wrong, but uh, it's interesting, even though the men were wrong it, in the journal, Meriwether Lewis writes, quote, the party said very cheerfully that they were ready to follow us anywhere. We thought proper to direct. And I like that. Basically by then they recognize, you know what, these captains are smarter than we are in this stuff. And, and even though we, we, we know a little bit about rivers, you know, they've got keen senses on these things. And so they, they follow them cheerfully. Now what's going to happen at this point is they're going to start heading up that, that Missouri river. And it's, it is getting clear. It's also getting shallower in spots. And as they're traveling up, uh, Lewis is going to separate, take a few men and go ahead of them, ahead of the boat party, because the boat party is just taking too long uh, to, to move forward. And he's going to basically, you know, scout it out what's ahead. And what he does is he runs into the Great Falls. Now, the Great Falls of the Missouri River were told to them by the Indians. To, hey, listen, the, you're going to come across these, these Great Falls. You've got, you've got to recognize they're, they're going to be hard, but you can't miss them. If you're on the right river, you're going to come to the Great Falls. You'll, you, you will know them when you get them. And he says on June 13, the Great Falls of the Missouri, this sublimely grand spectacle forms the grandest sights I've ever beheld. He had never conceived, had never seen anything so beautiful as this. Thing is, though, when he starts scouting it out, there's not just one fall, but five falls. And the captains, they had this idea they were going to be able to get around these falls in just a day and a half. It's not going to take us long to go around these falls. Well, that's simply not true. The reality is it took them much longer than that. The portage lasted 18 days and it greatly delayed them in a number of ways. They had the, they had to build little trucks, if you will, little to put all the canoes, all the equipment, all the baggage on and transport it across the plains around the falls and then when they get to the other side, um, they were going to construct an iron boat, this portable iron boat that they've been carrying all the way since West Virginia. Basically, when they, they put it together, uh, the boat put, put together right, but the skins that they needed to seal it, to make it work, um, uh, they, it just wasn't working. And so they, they scrapped that idea, which meant they had to dig two new canoes because they were counting on that big iron boat to carry a lot of the equipment. So they had The buffalo have trodden up the prairie very much. The sharp points of the earth are as hard as frozen ground, and prickly pears stand up in such abundance that there is no avoiding them. This is particularly severe on the feet of the men, who have not only their own weight to bear in treading on those hackle-like points, but have also the addition of the burden which they draw. The men have to haul with all their strength and weight and art. Many times every man catching the grass and knobs and stones with their hands to give them more force in drawing on the canoes and loads. At every halt, these poor fellows tumble down and are so much fatigued that many of them are asleep in an instant. Others faint and unable to stand for a few minutes. Violent storms punctuated the heat. A flash flood nearly drowned Clark, Charbonneau, Sacagawea, and her baby in a gully. Another storm brought hailstones, seven inches in circumference, that fell with such fury that the men were knocked to the ground. 
party returned to camp in great confusion, on the run, leaving their loads in the plains. The hail and wind being so large and violent, and them naked, they were much bruised and some nearly killed. One knocked down three times, and others without hats or anything on their heads, bloody and complained very much. I refreshed them with a little grog. This evening, the men repaired their moccasins and put on double soles to protect their feet from the prickly pears. Some are limping from the soreness of their feet. July 3rd. One pair of good moccasins will not last more than about two days. We'll wear holes in them for the first day and patch them for the next. And to their great concern, Sacagawea had become seriously ill. When bleeding her didn't work, the captains grew alarmed. They were counting on her help in getting horses from her people when they reached the Missouri headwaters. Lewis gave her doses of opium and had her drink from a sulfur spring he had discovered. Finally, she began to recover. In their winter plans, the captains had estimated it would take half a day to get around the falls. Instead, it took them nearly a month. By early July, the difficult portage was complete. Yes, on July 2nd of 1805, the portage was finally completed. But again, they still had more work to do before they could get back on, on the river and keep moving forward. They had to again cut out two new canoes, two big, large canoes, and th they hacked them out by hand. Uh, broke a number of axes in the process, but they did. It's interesting that on July 4th, uh, it's Independence Day. And, you know, even back then, they were just a, it's a few decades past um, the founding of our country. But even they recognize, you know, we got to take a moment and celebrate. Now, this is interesting because on July 4th, 1805, they do celebrate. They, they pull out the um, the fiddle. Peter Cruzat, the one-eyed fiddle man, pulls out the, the fiddle and they fiddle and they have a dance and they there's a lot of merriment and stuff. But this is also the day that the captains drained the whiskey. They drained the whiskey. They had a little bit they left over for medicinal purposes, but they gave out the whiskey mm -hmm. And uh, they gave out enough that some of the men actually got a little bit tipsy uh, from, from the amount they had. Now, to be fair, I, I was actually under the impression that they had been kind of doling out a little bit of whiskey uh, every single day, uh, all the way up the river at every, at every evening meal. That was kind of a standard military uh, procedure for that time, but that wasn't happening. Uh, they, they gave, they had two types of alcoholic drinks. One was whiskey. Uh, they have, they had literally started with 18 barrels of whiskey. And by the time they get here to Great Falls, Montana, the whiskey's gone as they had some rum along with them. But what they did was they would water down the rum to something they called grog and watered down rum was basically a way to make that rum go much longer. Well, everything was gone by the time they got to Great Falls. Even the, the rum was gone, the grog was gone, everything was gone. But they're gonna leave Great Falls and they're gonna head down and they're gonna turn south. In fact, at some points they actually turn not just south, but they start going east. And they were beginning to wonder, is this really the Missouri River? So as they traveled south, they eventually got to a place called the Missouri River Headwaters on July 25th of 1805. And this is where they, they have another question, a big question. It's kind of like decision point, except now they got three rivers. Uh, they're going to have to figure out which one is the right way. And so they're going to name these three rivers. They're going to name the Gallatin uh, after Albert Gallatin, Gallatin. And then there was this second, the middle river, they called the Madison, Gallatin, the Secretary of State. There was one that did a nice little hook. And they named that one the Jefferson because Jefferson wanted them to go west. And the only one that hooked to the west was the Jefferson. And so the Jefferson was the one that they chose, and that's the one that they traveled. 
And the thing is, once they get past this point and they start traveling to Jefferson, uh, it doesn't take long for the, the rivers to start getting shallower and shallower. There's more shoals. Uh, the, the cottonwood starts, the, the banks start to narrow. Uh, there's a lot of things happening that makes the makes the work, the boat party work even harder than before. And they're actually going to get to a spot where they're going to go, we don't want to do the river anymore. Let's find those horses and let's get this baggage on back some horses and let's let's do this right. And one day it got so bad that Clark actually stepped in and gave him a pep talk and said, come on, boys, you know, you know what this is all about. And we're doing our best that we can. We got to find the Shoshone. And that's the big question. But the good news is, is once they got past going down that Jefferson River, they eventually came to a place that Sakaga Wea saw and, and remembered very well. In fact, she was already starting to see the territory. When she was at Three Forks, that's where she got captured by the Hidatsas back uh, when she was just a, a few years younger. I mean, when she was like 11 or 12 years of age, she was captured by the Hidatsas. And they, they, they came in, they raided their the Shoshone camp, killed several of the men, uh, many of the men, and, and she, was, she was taken captive. And they took her. I think that's one of the reasons why she's going to know the Yellowstone a little bit as well. They took her probably down the Yellowstone to Fort Mandan area where the Hidatsas were, were uh, located. Um, but um, no, it was they, at Three Forks. She started to recognize where they were at. And then you have this beaverhead rock. And when she saw this, she knew immediately they were in Shoshone country. In fact, she got excited. She said, you know what, this is it. We should be meeting my, my home people anytime now. It's, it's called beaverhead because that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like a beaverhead. And here's another shot of it. Once again, Lewis is going to separate and he's going to travel ahead. The boat party is going much too slow for his preferences. And he's got a job to do. He has got to find the Shoshone Indians. And, you know, he travels these different little streams up and, and it keeps going higher and higher and higher. And eventually he gets to the spot where there's just nothing but a bubbling spring that pops out of the ground. And Lewis writes this in, on August 12th of 1805. He says, quote, this is the most distant fountain of the waters of the mighty Missouri. That's what we've been in search of, which we have spent so many toilsome days and restless nights. Judge then of the pleasure I felt in allaying my thirst with this pure and ice cold water. And that's exactly what he did. He got down on his hands and knees and he took a nice long drink of that pure mountain water. And he relished that he had found what he believed to be the original place, the start of the Missouri River. Of course, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Just a little bit down the mountain from there is where a man literally stood on either side of this little stream, because that's all it was by the time they got to it. It's just a little stream. And uh, he he straddles it, and, he's, and he thanks his God that he had gotten to this point to see the headwaters of the Missouri. Well, again, it's not the headwaters of the Missouri, uh, but their belief was this, that if they just you know, walked over the next ridge. And it was about 200, maybe 300 yards to the top. There was a ridge up there. They believed that they got up to that ridge. They would look over the other side and they would see another stream flowing in the other direction. When they did uh, get to that ridge and looked over, initially they saw nothing. They saw nothing. And it was disappointing uh, to them, especially to Lewis, because all they did see was mountain after mountain after mountain range. Right. And Lewis pretty well realizes at that point we have got to find the Shoshone we have got to get over these mountains uh, if we're going to ever do anything uh, if we're if we're, if we're going to get to the sea in fact he was really concerned that the expedition might just die there they they had uh, the game was getting scarce you realize they were used to eating nine pounds of meat per person you know back when the when the hunting was good uh, they were used to eating a lot of meat every single day well, by the time they get up to this part in the mountains, they're shooting squirrels. They're shooting quail. They're shooting a, a rabbit if they can. They're shooting small animals. They're not, you know, the, the bigger game isn't here anymore. There are no more buffalo up this high. Uh, even the elk, it's starting to get cold enough where the elk start to move down into the lower valleys. The deer were, were scarce. And he's starting to get concerned mm -hmm. and whether or not they can actually achieve uh, getting to the Pacific Ocean. It was a wake-up call. Lewis needs to meet those Indians. Well, not too much longer he does. In fact, on August 13th of 1805, 
he accidentally runs into a lone Indian up there on a hill. And the story is he literally got rid of his gun and he walked with a flag as close as he could to this, to this Indian warrior. And the Indian just turned around on his horse and took off. And so they followed his tracks. And long story short, they eventually come upon three uh, women, three Indian women. One was old, uh, older uh, woman. And the other two, one was like 12 years old. And the other one was more teenage, maybe 16, 17 years of age. Well, the, the teenager takes off because they surprise him. But when Lewis meets these women, you know, they, they're afraid. They think they're going to die. So these two Indian women, one an old woman, one a very, uh, basically an older child, preteen, they literally sit down on the grass and they lower their head expecting to be killed because that's what happened when they met their enemies. But Lewis, Lewis went to these women and said, uh, 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 we're here to help. He gave them gifts. You know, they, they, they talked in sign language and he kind of told them they wanted to meet their chief. And long story short, they're going to meet the chief when the chief meets them. Along the way, about 60, 60 Shoshone right up. The chief's name is Kamehawait. And Kamehawait basically has in mind that, you know, this little party we can take. And you kind of wonder if that didn't cross his mind at this point. It was, again, these women. We often forget about the Indian women in these stories. In this case, these Shoshone, these, these two, uh, actually three Shoshone now, because the, the teenage girl came back and led them to their camp. These three Shoshone women basically said, don't hurt them they're trying to find their way across the mountains and they need help. They need to buy horses. So they're going to have a council and they're going to get together. And this is where they bring in Sakagawea. Uh, Sakagawea knows Shoshone because she is Shoshone. Clark finally reconnects with Lewis and they, they bring Kamehawe together uh, on August 17th. And it is quite a surprise for Sakagawea because as she goes into the tent to do the, to do the interpretation so when Sakagawea came into that tent, into that council to meet with the, the Shoshone, she was, she was so happy. I mean, this was, this was, she was back home with her people, but she got a bigger surprise when she opened up the door because Kamehawait was there. And as she looked at Kamehawait, she recognized him. Kamehawait was actually her brother. Her brother is the chief. What a surprise. What a joy. What a wonderful moment. And that's amazing when you think about it. Here she was, stolen as a little girl, removed from her homeland, taken far, far away to Fort Mandan, uh, North Dakota, where she lives for several years. She gets married to a French trapper named Toussaint Charbonneau and just happens to have been in the right place at the right time where, where a, a core of discovery, a bunch of men come up from St. Louis and they're traveling on behalf of Jefferson, the great white chief, the, the president of the United States, and they hire Toussaint with with Sakagawea to help them, and in particular, to help them with the Shoshone. It's, you can't script this. This is just an amazing thing. Well, long story short, Kamehameha Waite said, hey, listen, anything you want, we'll help you. And they're going to spend some time there with the Shoshone. In fact, they're going to name that camp Camp Fortunate. They're going to spend 12 days there with the Shoshone. And I think um, Chicago, we actually probably had a choice at that point. I think she probably could have stayed there if she wanted to. This was her home. And I'm sure those warriors would have fought for that particular choice if she wanted to make it. But Sakaga Wea, she honored her, first of all, her marriage to Toussaint Charbonneau, who wasn't much of a husband. He really wasn't much of a husband to her, but she was at least honorable in that way. But she was also honorable to the core of discovery and their overall mission to get to the Pacific Ocean and back. She goes uh, with them. But it's interesting that Lewis, on his 31st birthday, he is doing some introspection. And he writes in his journal on August 18th, quote, I had as yet done but little. Very little indeed to further the happiness of the human race or to advance the information of the succeeding generation. I resolve in the future to redouble my exertions and in future to live for mankind as I've heretofore lived for myself. Now that is insightful, introspective thought there by Captain Lewis. And some people look at that and say, 
uh, he must have been really depressed. See that? I got to be honest. I'm not sure I see depression and morose in that particular statement. What I see is a man who's basically reached his 31st birthday and he's starting to go, you know what? I could do better. I could do better. My first 30 years, you know, I, I did live for myself. I did some things that I regret. I, I want to do better. And uh, I haven't done much to advance the information of the succeeding generation. I can do better with that. It's more of a resolve. It's more of a, there's a, I think there's a happiness, even a joy within uh, Lewis at this point. You know, he's looking forward. He's looking forward to going, to moving forward and to doing something significant. And in fact, he will. Well, as they leave Camp Fortunate, they do enter a period, a moment where things get a little difficult for them. The guide who has engaged with us to go on to the ocean tells us that there is two ways to go, but the one bearing south is plains and a desert country without game or water. The road to the north is rough and mountainous, but he said he could take us in 10 days to a river that would be navigable, or in about 15 days, we could go to where the tide came up and salt water. So we concluded to go that road. John Ordway. On August 31st, the expedition set off on 29 horses and one mule, led by an elderly Shoshone, the captains called Old Toby. They crossed a steep mountain pass and descended into the valley of a beautiful river, now called the Bitterroot. September arrived. The days were pleasant, but on the high mountains immediately to the west, they knew that snow was accumulating. September 10th. As our road next leads over a mountain to our left, our captains conclude to stay here this day to take observations and for the hunters to kill meat to last us across the mountains and for our horses to rest, etc. Though the day is warm, the snow does not melt on the mountains a short distance from us. The snow makes them look like the middle of winter. Joseph Whitehouse. Here the Indians told them some startling news. From where they stood now, the Missouri River near the Great Falls was only four days travel due east. By following the Missouri to its source, the Corps of Discovery had missed this shortcut. Instead of four days, it had taken them 53. Summer was over, and still they had the Bitterroot Mountains to cross. The most terrible mountains, wrote Sergeant Patrick Gass, that I ever beheld. Ah, yes, those mountains, those mountains. Uh, I, I like to call this chapter the starvation chapter because they are they're starving. They're literally to the point where they're eating their candles. There's 33 people here, uh, and they're weak, and they're starving, and they're sick. And, you know, we, you, you see them on horses here. Well, that's true, but a lot of them had to walk this, this low, low creek and pass over the Bitterroot Mountains up by Missoula, Montana. And it, it took them some time to get over that pass. And as they get down on the other side, uh, they are desperate for food. They are desperate for, for any type of sustenance. It's a terrible, terrible moment. They get over Lolo Creek and pass, and they come down the backside. And again, these mountains are some of the most terrible mountains that Patrick Gass said he has ever saw. He's talked about how the snow fell so thick on September 16th. On September 16th, it fell so thick that the day was so dark that they couldn't even see. For Later, he's going to write, we have somehow some hopes of getting out of this horrible mountainous desert. September 19th, as we have discovered the appearance of a valley about 40 miles ahead, when this discovery was made, much joy and rejoicing among the Corps. 
So as they're coming down out of the mountains on the other side, they were hoping to find a river and they really didn't, but they did find eventually a valley 40 miles in the, in the, in the distance. And they start moving towards that valley. As it starts to open up, they're going to run into the Clearwater river, but alongside that Clearwater is camped the Nez Pierce, the Nez Pierce, also known as the Nimipu, which literally means the people. The Nez Pierce is actually a, a French word. Did you know that? Nez Pierce means pierced nose. And what's interesting is none of them had pierced noses. Uh, they, they were nothing like that, but they got the name Nez Pierce or pierced nose by the French. Well, as they come off of the mountain, again, they're starving. They're on their last leg. Almost all of them are sick as dogs. Uh, they're weak. Uh, they're barely they're barely walking. Uh, some of them are even able to ride if they can. Uh, it's 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 a very difficult spot. And when they run into the Nez Pierce, the Nez Pierce immediately take a look at all the stuff that they've got. They immediately see all these provisions. They see all of this equipment. They see all this firepower. They see guns and ammunition. And they see an opportunity. And there's a story that emerges at this point that I find very interesting. It's really within the oral tradition of the Nez Pierce. The Nez Pierce give us the story. We can't confirm it from the journals. Uh, the journals give us no indication of, uh, of this story or of this moment. But the Nez Pierce have held on to it very strongly, and there are multiple streams, multiple traditions that go around, and they tell the same story. And I've talked with Nez Pierce uh, historians, and they're very comfortable with this particular part of the story. Now, th there's a lot to it, but let me just tell you what's going on. Essentially, there's a powwow going on among the Nez Pierce, and they're looking to destroy the core. They're actually thinking about how to kill them, not just some of them, all of them to get their horses, to get their equipment, to get their provisions, to get all the gifts that they had on. They saw all of that, all the firepower, all the ammunition, all the powder, everything. They saw all of that, the guns. It would have made them the richest Indian nation in the Pacific Northwest at that time. And so the Nez Pierce were, were actually looking to destroy Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery right there. They talked about running them off of a cliff. Maybe that was an option. Another was uh, was just to stab them in the middle of the night. They were plotting how they were going to do it, cut their throats in the middle of the night. Well, next door or nearby to this teepee that was holding this council of young braves who were brainstorming how they were going to kill the Lewis and Clark party was an old woman. And her name was Wakuwais. Now, Wakuwais has an interesting background herself. Like Sakagawea, she was stolen by another Indian tribe. And she was sold from different tribes to different tribes as a slave. Eventually, she winds up in the hands of a white family who take her back east. I want to, I want to say Michigan or Wisconsin, back in that area. They raise her to the point where she's now of age. And then they help her get back to her people, the Nez Pierce, this white family. Now that's interesting because Wakuways, you got to fast forward now decades. So Wakuways is sitting in her teepee and she's listening to the voices that are coming from a teepee several yards away and how they're going to destroy this, this company, this, this company of white men. And she goes right into the council and she says to them, do them no harm. These white people, they are the ones who saved me. They're the ones that taught me. Uh, many people think that part of the things they taught was she was taught how to read, maybe even how to write, possibly even Christianity. The, this white family did not believe in slavery. That's why she ended up with them. They bought her out of slavery. And now she was saying to her own people, do Lewis and Clark and their party, no harm. And on that moment, in that day, on that night, the attitude shifted. The Nez Pierce went from wanting to kill Lewis and Clark to eventually becoming their best friends. In fact, no one would even know this story if it wasn't for the oral traditions of the Nez Pierce. I love what Patrick Gass has to say about it, though. 
when he comes across, when, when they meet the Nez Pierce, the Nimi Poo, he says this, the Indians belonging to this band received us kindly, appeared as pleased to see us, and gave us such provisions as they had. Exactly. Basically, the Nez Pierce welcomed Lewis and Clark, welcomed the core discovery with, with open arms. Yeah. The Nez Pierce helped them get back to health. They're going to nurse them back to full health. They're going to show them how to build canoes, better canoes, better dugout. They're going to show them how to use burn, how to burn out a canoe, which is a faster way to, to build a canoe. They're going to do a lot of things to help the core get on that river and get all the way to the Pacific Ocean before winter. And that's the story of Lewis and Clark as they went across the Montana ranges, across the plains, across the mountains, eventually meeting the Shoshone, Kagawea meeting her brother Kamehawe, and then the Nez Pierce. It's an amazing, epic, glorious journey. And I appreciate you listening and coming along with me in this hour of discovery. We'll see you next time. If you are looking for more resources on this particular leg of the journey, I encourage you to go over to rickcromie.com and look under American Cruise Lines because that's what I, I'm a I'm a historian for American Cruise Lines on the Lewis and Clark story, and all my Lewis and Clark stuff is there under American Cruise Lines. Go there, and you can you can find the journals. I've actually gone through and I've got day to day. You can read what happened day to day in the journals, and those are there as well as many other resources that, um, including the the slides that go along with this particular session, they're all available for you there. RickCromie.com. <laughs>